Thank you very much. I will make a couple of disclaimers. I have a very broad Australian accent, so apologies. Um, so you might not follow some of the words. I do apologise for that. Um, the other thing too is obviously we've had some great speakers come up and talk about some key themes. So I'm going to continue those themes. So I might motor through uh, my slides very quickly and we'll give you an access to them. But who's going to be game at the end of this to sit in front of my lie detector to play the attention game? Because one of the key tenants we talked about, monkey brain, we talked about limbic system overdrive, even though we didn't say that. We said Instagram, that's a limbic system activator. It's brilliant. You see other people's lives and you get stressed out and then you think, oh my God, my life's not that good. Or how lucky are other people? So I can tell you how lucky I am. 1998, I finished my degree. I'm a cricketer, professional, 20 odd years ago. I received a uh, 25,000 pound sponsorship by Surrey. I'm going to England, fantastic. My dad was wrapped, being Punjabi, Sikh community. You know, my son's going over to England. On my way home, I was hit at 90 kilometers an hour. I was left on the side of the road, basically, if it wasn't for two hum you know, human people that pulled me out of the car, because petrol had started to leak out, God knows what could have happened, and all I could hear was, don't grab him like that, he'll end up with a spinal injury. Well, I'm oblivious to what's going on, but I couldn't feel my legs, and I've just had this dread going through my body, and it even upsets me to, to today to, to hear this. The ambulance, the paramedic said to me, oh, you're so lucky you're alive. And I looked at him with despair in my eyes saying, my life is over, thank you very much. And then it happened, the, the accident was, I wouldn't even say accident, it was an incident because of the actions of someone else. But this gentleman um, who hit into me said, I was really sorry, I had a few drinks after work and I didn't see you at the lights. I was stationary for at least five to 10 minutes and he just came straight through and so this is the journey of life. Having studied neuroscience, um, b being a psychologist as well, I took my life for granted. Someone else could come in here right now and take your life away from you. And yet we're all passengers to health. We're not the drivers of our life. We constantly say, oh, tomorrow we'll do this. Tomorrow we'll do that. Um, so that I'm really lucky. So I use that a lot. And that's where we're talking about the whole thing, the luck aspect. It's Russian roulette if you're not taking steps today to help yourself. You don't have to make drastic improvements. You just have to start the conversation. And it's really brilliant. Today we're talking about goals. You need to goal set. So I have a lot of these questions. Is stress choking your, your life you know, night and day? Um, do you want to learn how to be happy and healthy? Um, do you want to increase productivity? All these sorts of these questions come up a lot. Really, it's, it's been fantastic sitting here and listening to everyone, and you know, it's a great experience being here today to, to listen to people talking about a lot of these aspects. And one of the things was, what about the mind-body connection? I think a gentleman over here talked about the mind-body connection. The mind and body is connected. There is no difference. So when you're coming up to do public speaking, you can feel your stomach, you can feel things happening to you on a physiological level. That's because they're linked. The Japanese talk about the hara, the hara being your second mind, your second brain. And they do a lot of work, as we saw before, with the flow techniques for your stomach. I'm gonna show you a few case studies because I think I don't really wanna bombard you with the slides and the science, but we use a lot of science to prove and disprove a lot of theories that are going on there. The supplement industry is one. If you've got a full diet and you're doing really well and you're eating the micro and macronutrients that you require, supplement adds to that it's not going to help you if you're not eating correctly. So let's get that straight. A lot of people talk about heart rate variability. Do you know what that means? I, I feel like this. I think Professor Ashok said some really interesting things earlier. You basically, when you go to a doctor, you've got about eight or nine minutes for your consultation. And you go, doctor, I've got a sore throat, a, a sore neck, and the doctor says, here you go, take this. And it might be an antibiotic or it might be something else. How about if you went to your doctor and said, actually, Doctor, I feel I've got a sore throat, but you know what? My neck's a bit enlarged from three days before. It's a bit red. He can probably provide you a lot better understanding of yourself. It's about providing the insight. The doctor only has eight or nine minutes to really give you a, 
a level of ease and a level of comfort that you're going to leave with some expectation of, of, of curing your, your symptoms, right? And so that's why we use a lot of these techniques. So I've got the lie detector up front. I want someone to come up later and sit in front. It's not a lie detector. It's a neurofeedback device. So we train the brain waves. And see, everyone's like, quiet. Whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> come on. And then we've partnered up with the company from Finland that they specialize in heart rate variability, stress diagnosis. And what they do is they power 90% of the wearables that we have. So they're an ex business that was basically a lot of Nokia engineers. So Nokia devolved. And all these engineers are coming up now. So Shunto, Polar, First Beat, Aura, they're all going out to build these devices. And it's unbelievable what's going on in Finland right now. So I'm, one, I'm also one of their master trainers and we do lots of work around identity physiology and we use that as part of my practice. Neuroplasticity, we talk a lot about neuroplasticity. Does, do people believe here that we're fixed in intelligence and that we're, we're born with a certain level of intellect and we're born we, no, we're not. We're constantly evolving. We're constantly learning. One of the biggest issues with the human form is that we are designed to be negative and we, we take that stimulus for an action. That's how we've survived. That's how we've basically evolved. And that's where, when Suk was talking about the stress response and the negativity, we're, we're bound by negativity. So basically, when you scold your children, when you tell other people off, they never forget that. So it's very important that we give constructive criticism to people, not negative criticism, because some people take it the wrong way and you can never bring that back. How our practice started about was really there's four pillars to health and Sook talked about the three, being the mental, physical, emotional, and, spirit, uh, and uh, physical. But we also talk about the spiritual. And I don't mean as in terms of, a lot of feedback I've sent up here. Uh, I don't mean in terms of, um, religion for example, but spiritual is your sense of purpose. Why are you here? What do you want to achieve with your life? I know uh, Dilraj talked about it. he always wanted to be a doctor and I, I take my hat off to Dilraj because that's fantastic. He's, he's in it for the right values. Um, with myself, I always wanted to be in allied health. My mum was a doctor and I always was at loggerheads with my mum. It's, I didn't agree with a lot of the practices in the medical profession to be honest with you and I'm very outspoken. I was one of the first people through uh, Professor Trevor Norman in Melbourne who talked about giving children retinol for ADHD. We were totally against it. I mean, why, why are we medicating our children with speed? I'm not meaning to be a political thing today, but it's bizarre because what we're going to do is if we give inputs to a certain cohort and we're giving them, we're giving them amphetamines because we're going to speed up their brain because their brains are so fast, then what happens when they become adults and they have children? We start to create these um, cohorts that are now willing to take basically pharmacological devices and products as a way out. And this is really quite dangerous. We talked about the body and as you can see here, autonomic nervous system on the left hand side, the sympathetic chain, when we get the fight and flight response, covers 90% of what's going on. And we have this fantastic nerve called the vagus nerve it runs from our tongue all the way down to our backside that we should engage with we've lost our tone with this parasympathetic and, and I, I know we talked about mindfulness before which is brilliant everyone's talking about mindfulness and meditation all mindfulness is it's an attention tool mindfulness just means one simple thing we can focus our attention here and then i can move my attention over there but you need a lot of practice to do that because i'm still thinking about my friend over here right now i should be thinking over here and this is where the monkey brain and all these sorts of things are going on because we can't detach from the connection over here to something over here unless we actually work on that. And that's where we talk about the attention game. And I'll get someone in front to sit and there's no judgment. It takes a lot of time. When I had my car accident, I was very driven. So when I looked back at it, I was also harming myself a lot because I didn't think I was good enough. And so when I had the car accident, everything stopped for me. I started to write a list of all the things in my life that was actually doing me quite a lot of damage. And one of them was my mindset. I always believed my mind was the strongest thing, but it was also killing me as well. Because when I went out to, to perform, and if I didn't perform to my best, I had a really poor day. But when you're in a team of 11 or 12 people, and as a, as a leader in the team, or invariably I was always captain or vice captain or whatever from a leadership ability, if my, if my bowling team side did really well and the batsmen did what they did and we won, I should be happy for them. But I was like, hang on a minute, 
my personal um, performance today was, was terrible. What am I doing? And then later I started to realize when the world had to slow down and when I had to physically sit in my bedroom and I wasn't allowed to move around and I wasn't allowed to, to do a lot, it was think about these things. My mindset is, yes, very strong, but it's also extremely weak. And we need to work on that. And it was like when I went into the corporate world and I was doing a lot of work in risk management and getting understanding of how people behaved and the responses, I started to realize if you're going to be a leader you need to start with yourself. You need to heal oneself so other people see you. 90% of what I'm doing right now is non-verbal, right? And you're picking that up. So if I say to you, oh, don't put your hands in the fire, but I'm always touching the fire, obviously the people around you are gonna say, well, his actions don't marry up with his words. Is he authentic? Does he really care? And you know, we've made a challenge next year to, to basically get across to one million people and ultimately have a free institute. That's where we wanna go. And people think I'm crazy, but I've got to start somewhere. We've got to dream big. And, you know, just meeting the two guys has been one of the most fundamental things coming back to the UK, having this discussion, because we're all on the same page. And we're all trying to impart some help and tools for people. So it's, it's fantastic. Where are we going with all of this? Self-regulation equals self-control. You don't need to take the mobile phone devices away, but you need to understand how to use them. When you've got someone like Elon Musk talking about that we are cyborgs and that we're already connected and he was talking about limbic system override, I was just like, wow, this guy, he's at another level for me. I thought Elon Musk was a fantastic business person as we know, but when he's talking about that high level, he's talking about neuro link technology and syncing up with people, for me, it's game over because he, he's, he's exactly right. We don't have any self control. Like you see people, I was just in uh, Dubai, over last weekend and you know there was a buffet going on and people were just loading up their plates and I'm like wow the food's not going anywhere where's the, there's no self-control and Vegas is even worse <laughs> most of you have probably seen it it was such a put-off for me so I just got my omelette and I left I was like I can't be here um, we need to get self-control we need to take control of our lives we need to start becoming the drivers and it doesn't matter what age you have got to start now because you invariably some of you will have grandchildren some of you have got children, got friends that might not be well. I mean, how many people put up your hands here that you've been, the doctor's told you you need to make some health improvements? How many people? Don't be shy. Yeah, we all have been. Have we started the process? Uh, good. Some people is in the room that's like, ah, oh, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Keep going. We like to use a lot of data. So the heart math, as Sue was saying before, has done a lot of studies. The studies are there, you know. Um, as I said before, I worked in high risk industries. So I worked in the petrochemical game for a while, construction, you name it. And we used a lot of the philosophies and techniques around um, this self-control and bio-neurofeedback to understand why we're having errors. You know, why are people putting themselves at risk even though we've got all these uh, errors and violations? And, my mentor was Tony Barbita, so he um, was 45 years in one company, he's seen a lot. He basically built most of Australia. Everyone knows Tony. Yeah? Sounds like a mafia, Tony Barbita. <laughs> anyway, and um, he said to me, Ahmed, it's because people are fatigued. They're coming to work in a really bad health state. They're not coming to work fit, happy and healthy. They're coming to work because, oh, I've got to get some, I've got to make some money and oh, no, no. <coughs> They're not coming in, in, in their best health position. And then invariably some of them people, are, they're not leaving work because they, they have been either seriously injured or to hospital or they have unfortunately died. And so it got us really thinking about if you increase in your resilience across the four pillars, being physical, mental, emotional and spiritual, you'll have greater life satisfaction. Quality of life is what we're after increased productivity and we'll have less work-related incidents. And we started to see that across a lot of our projects. It even got to the point in one company I worked for on the board, we worked exclusively in the Middle East and, and Africa. We left that region because we said we cannot provide that for our workers, so let's go. And I couldn't believe it. They were making billions of dollars. They left because the board believed that this is not the right place that we need to be because we cannot do that. This is about values. It's about your mission. It's about what you want to achieve in life. So resilience for us is not about bouncing back. I think bouncing back is, 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 is really a bit of an oxymoron in, in some regards because if 
you're bouncing back. You've actually got to go through a condition and you've lost something then to come back. And I say come back to what? A good friend of mine suffered from cancer and he looks about 80 now. He's 55, he looks 80 and he said, look, I, I've lost half my tongue. I've lost everything inside. He was in the, he was in the submarines, in diesel submarines, so he, he developed cancer. And he said, Hammett, I would have preferred to have been dead, but I survived because I've got two children that needed me. Now that they've made university, this is not a quality of life. I can't come here today and have something to eat. I've got to prepare everything. I can't go out there because I'm drooling all the time. And this is the thing that, you know, his was created from his work environment. And that's where we're talking to a lot of corporate environments is to get them to understand what you're doing now to your workforce. You have such a great control over that. So this is us, the resilience factor. Um, we are running camps and we're starting some camps up in November. Over the, uh, they go from anywhere from two to four days across these key tenants. Um, we've also developed an app. Hello. Yep. Uh, coaching high performance. We've got a lot of partners and brand ambassadors that fit within our ethos. Um, thought leadership seminars like this coming today, just to talk to people and, and, and interact is brilliant. We are looking at down the track developing a lab and an institute. And the institute, I've been speaking to a lot of people in London, they think this is a crazy Australian that's here, is that that's going to be a free service. So that will be part of our ecosystem that we're building, is that we're getting other like-minded health practitioners that have been in the game for a long time to offer their services for free to anyone that requires it. They can come in, if they've got financial issues, they can talk to financial people. If they've got you know, mental health uh, disorders that need requirement, and it could be anything. So we, we're getting a lot of momentum on that. So I just, I will go through these next slides really quickly, but I just want to show you the state of play in the UK at the moment, and it's very damning. So at the moment, it's a bit of a pressure cooker situation. You know, there's like 20, 29 deaths of suicide among 10 to 19 year olds in 15, 16 compared to sort of 14, 30, you can see the numbers, the numbers are growing rapidly. Um, the problems on the, in, are on the increase, these obviously data from uh, up to 2014, but as you can see, more and more people are getting diagnosed with mental health disorders. And they're saying it's because it's good education. It's a lot of people are also now, they've had enough. So it's not just it's a good marketing campaign, it's also that people just cannot function anymore. So they, they're starting to say, well, what else can I do? Um, women are now likely to be affected. I noticed in Australia we had, a, we had an um, epidemic with domestic abuse, where a lot of women were getting abused for years. They would leave, they didn't know where to go. Their, their husband was the, the breadwinner. It was, it's, it's, it's a very tragic situation to be in. Uh, men, as we know, a lot of men have pressures now. Men are more likely to, to take their own lives. Th this is a particular area that really really worries me is children the next generation so I've got three young children myself I've got to be their role model um, you know people that are in my friendship circle being males they're, they're the role models for my children as well and I'm the role models for their children you know mental health problems start early um, so you can see it. it could be through trauma it could be through poor diet and nutrition it could be through other health conditions that, that are undiagnosed, that are um, popping away. Speaking of, of, of popping away, we are taking lots of pills. Look, look at that, 2006, 31 million. 2016, 61 million. So we're just looking for this silver bullet so forth. Take this, this is gonna make you feel great because it worked on someone else. And you know, this is where, we, where we've got to start really focusing on ourselves. <coughs> And then long distance treatment. It's sometimes very hard to get treatment within the, within the service. So we believe we have a solution. And we're not saying we have the solution, but we have a solution. The solution is each one of you taking care of your own health. How do you do that? By developing insight. So you start the journey. Start to understand yourselves. Create a habit. And that's what it's about today. Create the lifestyle. Um, so Dr. Rick Hansen, who is an expert in resilience, talks about if you want to have lasting well-being in the changing world, you need to have resilience. There are things that are going to affect you every day. If you cannot rise to that, those issues, they will overwhelm you. I, believe me, I've been there. They will overwhelm you. You know, I don't say this very openly, but when I was sitting in my, in my room on the second story after basically I've been told, 
we don't know what's going to happen with you. I could very easily jump through that window, but I didn't because something inside to me said, there's more to life than this, don't worry about it. But I've had friends, I've had about five or six friends that we played sports with at a very high level that didn't make the cut, didn't make the Australian team. I mean, it's so hard to make the team. There's thousands of really good athletes in a country of 22 million people. So you're not gonna make it. And I, I never thought I would make it, so it wasn't a worry for me, but they didn't make it and they have done things to self-harm. One or two of them are in hospital, in psychiatric wards, and several others have, have taken their own lives. So that for me starts to open up these ideas. And I don't wanna have, you know, a very heavy session with you guys, but it's about taking the health in your own hands. So I've got a couple of case studies. So I had a young boy by the name of Dibi Papadados. Um, when he came to see me, he was like over a thousand in the world playing. He'd lost his US card. He'd lost his European PGA card. He loves, he loves playing in Europe. He's a Greek background. So he loves, he loves going to the islands. He loves a lifestyle. He, he basically lost the, when he lost the US card, he wasn't so upset because he doesn't really like America. He wanted to just play in Europe. But when he lost his European card, he came back to Australia and he was basically told, why don't you just quit? You're not built to play golf. You've got a physique of a rugby player. He's six foot two, 100 kilos, powerful boy. And all these sports psychologists said to him, you're just too weak mentally. So he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to work on his mental game. There's absolutely nothing wrong with his mental game. He has very unstable mental arousal. So when he is aroused and he's in the zone, his saliva starts tasting sweet, he has to capitalize. He didn't know how to manage that feeling and he didn't have any insight into his playing performance. So in golf, in 30 minutes, you could make or break your whole day and you're playing with some unbelievable talent out there. I can tell you now, I've been to many different tournaments. It's phenomenal what's going on and the sports science that's involved, you know, and he's not doing anything. He's based in Australia, you know, two hours out of Sydney, some little town, you know, they've got one pub. <laughs> he's the brightest and best. And so we started working on it and we started to really identify through a lot of means that he has emotional regulation issues he has a lot of self-doubt, he has a lot of fears. He doesn't want to face his fears. So he said to me, I've got no fears. Nothing phases me. I said, Timmy, we've all got fears. I've got fears that I can't afford to keep my family in the, in the, in the lifestyle that they're, they're, they're used to and the private school fees and all sorts of other things. And he said, oh, I haven't got fears. I said, Timmy, your biggest fear is that you don't want to put in all the work and work so hard because if it doesn't pay off, Everyone's gonna say, oh, you did all that extra work and nothing happened from it. Said, who cares? Don't worry about what other people have to say, ladies and gentlemen, you need to address your own fears. We all have fears, unless we're robots. Um, and even they probably have fears, right? So what we did was we started working with him and it was before the Australian Open, he'd never made the cut. So Australian Open happens in November and that year in 2016, I spent five days with him. And he was happened to be staying at his cousin's house who lived around the corner from me. So it was very easy to, to monitor what he was doing. Dimmy takes four or five hours to get, get going in the morning. What, what, did the, what did the PGA give him? Seven o'clock tee off times. So you think about what time Dimmy has to get up. Poor Dimmy, he's gotta get up at three o'clock, right? He said like about seven alarms because he's so, <laughs> he takes a long time to get up. So we did the first session I, and we identified what was going on and, and his dad was a very uh, famous uh, wrestler in Australia. So he's got a lot of pressures from the family as well. Anyway, did the first session. Dimmy basically said to me, look, Amit, this is a waste of time. This is rubbish. Don't believe in it. I said, Dimmy, that's fine. And I'm not, and he's not paying for it either, mind you. It's all free, okay? Because I believe in my product and it's not about, because a lot of people, when they have to pay money, they think, oh God, this is, you know, he's just after money. It's all commercial. So, Dimmy, let me just show you the power of your own mind. It's not even about me. I'm just a facilitator. It could be someone else. So we did the first session. I overworked him a little bit. He said, oh, I'm feeling a bit tired. I said, Dimmy, go to bed. Well, he got up at two o'clock in the morning ready to go. His cousin's like, why are you up so early? He's like, I don't know what this guy did. He's like a witch doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so Dimmy went there first day, played well. It's a warm up round, day one, day two. Day two, good, he's made the cut. Wow, Dimmy's come back from nowhere. 
This is the talent back in early 2000s that won the New Zealand tour and won this and won that. And they haven't heard of him in four years. So they start interviewing him. What are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm not doing anything. Um, I've just recently met this guy. He's helping me a little bit. It's all going well. That's all he said. Thanks, Dimmy. Great, ad great, great advocate. Yeah. Right? In the same token, Jordan Spieth, who was world number one golfer, some of you might have heard of Jordan Spieth. Jordan Spieth came to Australia. And he's Jordan Spieth. He's Under Armour. Gets $10 million for Under Armour. He's the big deal. He came after day two and said, I've worked at the whole course, I'm going to win it. And Dimmy, we're into day three. Dimmy and Jordan Spieth are a one for one. Dimmy said to me after day three, I can win this. I said, Dimmy, you're not going to win this. Jordan Spieth has done 10 years of hard training at the best institutes. He's been with Red Bull Academy. You've been with the Amit Oberoi Academy, mate, and you've only spent four, three or four days at this point. You need a lot of work. If we finish top 20, and this is again about setting your expectation level, right? His expectation suddenly got up here. Timmy, come back down to earth. We've got to be here. We first got to crawl before we can walk. So to, to finish off that story, look, Timmy came in the top 20, and it was a massive pat on the back. And what happened from there was that he then won the next three tournaments in local Australian tournaments. So then he basically got the next four years off in Australia. And what that catapulted was that the Europeans started to say, oh, he's taking himself seriously. He's got a mental performance coach. That's what they were calling me. And they were interviewing me. And I'm, like, I'm no mental performance coach. I'm a facilitator. I kept saying, no, you're a neuroscientist. Let's do that. It's a marketing campaign. Yeah, come on. And the guys from Titles were like, do you want to be in these magazines? No, it's about Dimmy. It's not about me. I'm just the person in the background. So fast forward. Dimmy's come back to Europe. He decided to go to Europe. And I said to him, you're not prepared. So he, he had a bit of an aborted start last year. But now, he's back here now. He's playing really well. He's won a couple of tournaments. He won in Portugal. He came second up in Luton a month ago. And he's back on track. So we're getting him back on track. And he, he's a young guy. He's 26. He started playing golf at six. So when they told him to quit, 20 years he's invested into golf, right? So we had, we've had other people. We've had corporate financial executive, Mrs. X, very interesting, who basically was very high-powered financial type, but none of her team members could, could uh, keep up with the, with the frenetic pace of what was happening. So much so, this management organisation, which is global, the London headquartered company, said basically, you've done very well, but we have to let you go because you're burning out everyone around you. And so we were providing some other services and then I was talking to them about specifically about the lie detector and that's how I think I got the work because <laughs> they're like, let's find out what's really going on. And we started to realise that um, Mrs X was on heavy, heavy drugs, on uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors at very high dosage and for the last 10 years. And so I was a moron. Her children were hopeless. Her husband was a loser. Everyone around is the problem except for her. So it was going to be a hard task, right? We had five sessions, and that was enough for her to say, I've got to get off the medication. And then, because she's this alpha type, very highly driven, said, I don't need you anymore. I said, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> she was hard work. <laughs> she went on her own health journey. And if we just impart a little bit of, uh, you know, the the high octane power to some people, they get, that just helps them with, their, with the whole conversation. It's not about me constantly being in someone's life or the others in my team being in your life. It's about just giving you a kickstart. And we gave her the kickstart and you know, she's now on her own journey. Um, we provide for businesses as well as we dis discussed, but I'm at a private school with my children at the moment and I sort of identified a, a young boy who's been Basically, they've said that he's dyslexic. And so I, I go there to pick up my children, and I spoke to the parents. And I said, look, this is what I'm doing. This is a service. And they said, oh, what's the price? And I said, listen, your son may need 50, 60 to 100 types of sessions with me or my team. You're not going to be able to afford it. I'm prepared to do five free sessions this year because my time's quite crucial to myself. Let's just do the, the five. Um, let's just start off for free. So after session one, they said, oh, can we still pay you? And I said, listen. No, because we made a commitment to each other. So half the battle is making commitment to each other. So you meet me halfway and I'll meet you halfway, right? So we did that. 
So we're, at, we're going to be session number five or six this coming Sunday, because he normally comes every Saturday. But two weeks ago, his father came, because his father was like interested in what's going on. And his father said, you know, I've noticed a real change in my son. And I said, look, I don't want to alarm you, but your son has also got obsessive compulsive disorder. Do you know that? And he said, no. I said, poor kid, he gets so anxious and so wound up that he scratches his skin to the point where it's red. And I saw he was wearing a t-shirt and it was, his arms are just eaten alive. And it broke my heart because he's been to psychiatrists, he's been to um, child therapists, and no one picked it up because he's been hiding it. And so, you know, we talk about the breathing techniques. It's one of the crucial techniques you can learn. Mindfulness. So after four or five of these sessions, he's now starting to engage. He's starting to know himself a lot better. Even so, the fact that they play a strategy game at home and he won the first time the other weekend. And that's amazing. It's not that he has dyslexia. It's just a title they're using in this case because they can't really understand what he has. He has he has one part of the brain that is revved up. It's always on overdrive. So he's very good athletically. We know that. Because you, these are labels you don't want to have. It's just like, I've got a name. That's my label of this vessel. I don't want to have another label. With, with the camps, we, we talk a lot about resetting people. So it's about getting good resets. So we do baseline. We get all your schematics before people come to the camp and then during the camp we basically give you tools and we get an understanding of where you are so we have before and after. You get meaningful actionable data so you know where you are and then what you need to do. And then you, you know conclusively that this is the state of play in my life and then, it's, and then basically the ball is in your court in order to get your life kick started. That's me, reach out. Happy to have a chat. I can talk underwater, so I think I'll leave it there <laughs> because my uh, attention span is uh, waning, and I'm, I need some something to eat as well. But do we? Ha how are we time-wise? Do we have time to hook someone up, or do we do do it later? So basically, what's going to happen now is we talked about the attention game. This is about focus and attention. Obviously, there's a lot of noise, but that's fine. Um, we do this in a lot of cases where we we have some rugby players and so forth. We do it within their locker room, so the noise is a good thing in some regard to see how attentive people can be. So we talked about before, uh, you want measurable data on how attentive you are. Let's see how attentive, sorry, what was your name? Uh, Mahendra. Mahendra is, with everyone uh, eyeing at him and, and talking. So basically, just getting the, uh, the metrics coming through here, all, all the different brain waves, and the Mahindra is <coughs> gonna play a game where he has to open up these pictures, you know, open up these boxes to create a picture, all right? And you'll hear beeping, the beeping is op we, it's oper operational um, operant conditioning. So basically we're, we're giving the brain some stimulus and feedback that it's doing the right thing, so it'll continue to do that. So we have lots of different types of tasks we can do. We, can do, we have um, other, so this is just a picture game. We have other tasks where you might have to have three or four things happening where you have to work them out. And so we can, we can train, and we can train different parts. So across your scalp, you've got 20 different locations we can train. So we're just going basically to the central point and um, just for demonstration purposes, but we can generally go to all different areas and do a diagnosis first, have a look at what's happening. Uh, work out what's going on and then we just start training areas. It's all about just basically you get better regulation. I made it a little bit harder so you don't think it's just uh, on autopilot there. <laughs> When it slows down, his attention just waning, or there's a slightly a sticking point. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes, so with um, a couple of the patients that we've got, we've got certain areas of their brain just does not want to be trained, doesn't want to be told what to do. 
So over time, we want to increase that area, so just to get a slight regulation. So what happens is certain parts of your brain is more dominant. And when we talk about monkey brain, there could be a particular area which just over dominates you. So if that's happening, you should really think about it. When does this, so with a journal, one of the good aspects is to write, when are you having that same thought? So we talk about monkey brain, but there's obviously a couple of thoughts that always keep coming into your life. So write them down and just get a feeling of how you feel and when it's coming in and to start to give yourself a little bit of a better map of where it's coming from because then you can work on that aspect. You've got to sort of dive a little bit deeper. And uh, so what we, we're looking for is just a better regulation overall. Um, we're not here to really try and it's not fix or be fixed. It's about just getting better regulation of yourself. And then through time, you get more insight. You're able to understand how your brain operates and you can then start to get that rewiring process to then increase your performance overall. So you don't want to have an area that's dominating because then you just have thoughts and feelings and emotions that just really do control you or you don't get the performance that you require if you have to be more attentive to tasks. Do you practice mindfulness, meditation? Um, I've started. See, there you go. He's a cheater. <laughs> <laughs> It's a distraction. It's a good distraction. Someone told me yesterday that laughing can kill you, so be careful. Don't laugh too much. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> Not fair. No, he's, we, just, we just got told he was cheating, so yeah. I'm sure yeah, we have to make true. it higher. Yeah. Yeah. I did this with the CEO uh, before I came um, to the UK. And he's a really soft-spoken guy. He's just motoring through the whole program. He said, oh, mate, I've been meditating for 20 years. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> 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 what, what are you going to um, look, we, we haven't done the, basically the setup initially, but basically what we're looking for is just a better regulation. So we would, we would test a couple of key locations. Part of it, we, got, we have protocols that we follow. And then what we're looking for is areas that we can just train to get more harmony. I suppose that's what we're looking for. Um, and then you get a better insight of what's going on. So we've just put it straight in the central CZ location. So basically it's just how the prefrontal cortex is talking to the rest of the brain. We've just gone straight there for the testing purposes. Yeah, but generally we would, we would want a deep dive. We spend 15 to 20 minutes deep diving just to get a bit of an understanding. We have a lot of different checklists that we, checks and um, conditions that we go through first. But this is just for today's purposes. We just show you how it operates. Is this training as well or is this more of a... Two parts. One, we do the measurement analysis part first, and then we do training, depending. So we've just set it in a location that... So to improve yeah. out the game, would you play the game more and more, or would you do something some other um, Several things we can do. We can play the game more and more because part of that's gameplay, but that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in your profile, how your EEG patterns are going, and then we just use, the, we just use these games as, to, a, as, a, as a measurement, yeah, back end. What would be the process that's to, to see a distinct difference in, in performance? Um, like how long would you have to be doing training? Well, it just depends on person to person. It depends what you're doing outside of this. So this alone is one element. You know, nutrition needs to be on point as well. We need to look at that. Yeah, yeah. But what we can find is here, arousal levels will change. Your mental arousal will change. You will find you're getting a lot sharper. Um, the monkey brain starts to dampen down. And so, you know, you'll see, you'll see improvement. But the thing is too, when you see the improvement, you know yourself, you know what that feeling is. So even with Dimmy, he's like, I know. So with Dimmy now more, he says, when I go to a tournament now and I'm setting up and I'm, I do a practice round, he said, I start to feel really comfortable and ease. And he's got a lot of things he needs to do as well yeah. in the same token. Do you have any um, general recommendations for, for exercise? Yeah, there's plenty of things, yeah. But it comes back to your, your goals and stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely the functional training. And now I'm out of time. <laughs> yeah, we we analyze the data. We basically after each session we analyze what's happened prior to. We analyze the data and then we, we see are we on track with the goals we initially set up with you? And then we, we get that and then we, we basically analyze it and say yes you are making improvement here. If not then we, we start to basically just change our protocols to meet the requirement. But again, 
it's, it's like time under tension. If, if you're going to the gym and you want to get bigger muscles, what do you do? You don't just pick up the heavier weight. It's about time and attention. It's about habit forming. And what are the things you're doing outside of the, if we use the gym, so we call this the mind gym. What are you doing outside of the mind gym that's helping you? Are you doing your journal writing? Are you, are you practicing your, your meditation? Are you eating well? You know, are you walking? Are you doing exercise? Exercise is fundamental. We've got to move. We're designed to be moving around constantly. 